Scroll 16. Lupus rushed out of the tavern and almost collided with Avitus, who was bending over the road. The boy jumped back just in time to avoid being splattered with vomit. Avitus didn't notice the beggar boy, who had been in his daughter's room earlier that day. He wouldn't have noticed a sea nymph riding by on a centaur. He was being violently ill. Lupus backed off and hid behind a statue of the Emperor Claudius. Avitus was sick until finally he was retching up nothing. At last he stood, looking pale and haggard, his heavy eyebrows a dark line across his brow. He wiped his sweaty forehead with his arm and turned north towards the Imperial Harbour. It was a beautiful blue afternoon and as the day cooled the port was coming to life. Venus's breath had whipped up the sea beyond the river mouth and it was a deep sapphire colour. The sails of ships moving to and fro on the water made triangles of white and yellow against the blue. The air was so clear that almost every brick of the distant lighthouse was visible against the afternoon sky. It was as if Lupus was seeing the structure for the first time. The tower looked like three huge red dice piled one on the other, each smaller than the one below, with a great plume of smoke furling away from the cylindrical platform at the very top. Perhaps Avitus was also seeing the lighthouse as if for the first time, for presently he set off straight towards the ferry, which would take him across the Tiber to the new harbour. Somehow, Lupus knew the little girl's father was heading for the lighthouse, and somehow he thought he knew why. Sit down on the sand, said Flavia firmly to her friends as the dogs approached. Sit down? Are you mad? Jonathan's voice was a bit too shrill. A pack of wild dogs are heading straight for us, about to chew us to pieces, and you say sit down. That's what Pliny says to do, says Flavia. Your father lent me his book about natural history. Pliny says an angry attack can be averted by sitting on the ground. Dogs not angry, said Nubia, gripping Flavia's arm. What do you mean the dogs aren't angry? yelled Jonathan. They're wild, rabid, mad, hydrophobic killers. He pulled his sling from his belt. The slave girl knew immediately what it was and put a restraining hand on his arm. No throw rock, make dogs angry, she pleaded. Jonathan hesitated and then looked to Flavia for guidance. The dogs were almost upon them. She's been right about everything else so far, said Flavia. Let's trust her. She paused. And let's trust Pliny too. Sit down. Flavia sat cross-legged on the sand, pulling the other two down beside her. Jonathan closed his eyes and began muttering something in his native language. Flavia suspected he was praying. The dogs were now so close that she could see their eyes and pink tongues. The lead dog had something in its mouth. Flavia was afraid to look. She closed her eyes but then opened them a crack to peep through. The thing in the dog's mouth looked like a child's arm or maybe a dirty leg bone. She closed her eyes again and waited for the inevitable chomp of jaws on her flesh. Now the creatures were so close that she could hear their tongues panting and smell their doggy breath. She stifled a scream as several cold noses prodded and sniffed her, but she felt no pain. Presently, she heard a low growl. The new leader, a brown dog with pointed ears and face, stood before them, his tail wagging. He had dropped the mysterious object on the sand. Flavia peeked with one eye, then opened the other. A stick, she gasped. It's only a stick. And then, 
as the realisation dawned. They want us to play with them, to throw the stick. That's all they've ever wanted, laughed Jonathan, and Nubia began to laugh too. And we thought they wanted to kill us. With tears of laughter and relief flowing down her face, Flavia knelt and reached for the stick. The leader watched, alert and panting eagerly. Flavia stood, drew back her arm as far as she could and then threw the stick towards the blue line of the sea beyond the dunes. Like arrows released from a bow, the dogs were after it, barking and yelping with delight. Run, laughed Jonathan, scrambling to his feet and helping Nubia up. The three of them ran as fast as they could away from the dogs towards the tombs. But before they had reached the harder ground which bordered the necropolis, the dogs were back again, surrounding them. Again the leader dropped the stick. This time, however, Flavia reached for it too quickly. The leader lunged forward, snarling, and almost seized her hand. Oh, cried Flavia, I startled him. Let Nubia do it said Nubia softly. She reached for the stick carefully and threw it hard towards the sea. Again, the dogs went one way and the children the other. Again, they soon surrounded by the dogs. Now it's not so funny, gasped Flavia as she threw the stick again. At this rate, it will take us hours to get home. And the sun will be setting soon, added Jonathan, whose asthma was making him wheeze again. Father will murder me when I get back. <laughs> Cheer up. Maybe the dogs will kill you first, joked Flavia, and was relieved to see Jonathan grin back. Once again, they were surrounded by a solid, panting mass of dogs and presented with a wet, sticky stick. It was Jonathan's turn to throw it. He gingerly picked up the sopping piece of driftwood and allowed some of the saliva to drip off it. What does Pliny say about mad dog slobber? He asked, wrinkling his nose. The leader growled. The dogs were becoming more and more impatient, more and more demanding. Something had to be done. Nubia has idea, ventured the slave girl, of escape from dogs. The others turned and looked at her hopefully. Just as Lupus was about to slip through the gate of the low wall surrounding the lighthouse, one of the guards playing dice looked up. Hey you! he bellowed, jumping to his feet. Get away from there! The other two glanced over. They looked bored. Lupus grunted in protest and pointed urgently at the lighthouse. Avitus had passed through the gate unchallenged only a moment before. The soldiers had been so intent on their game that they hadn't noticed him. I said, get out. The guard lumbered over and thrust his face into Lupus's. His breath reeked of garlic and his tunic stank of sweat. Lupus lowered his arm and then, opening his eyes wide as if in surprise, he pointed again. At last the guard turned to look, but Avitus had just disappeared into the lower entrance of the tower. Lupus let his shoulders slump and turned as if to go. Then he whirled round and darted through the gate while the soldier's guard was down. Lupus was quick, but the soldier was quicker, and Lupus felt the air knocked out of him as the soldier grabbed his belt from behind. The other two guards rose to their feet and sauntered over. Look, you, said Garlic Breath, holding Lupus aloft by his belt. I'm going to count to ten, and when I finish, I don't want to see your snotty little face anywhere around here, or else I'll throw you in the harbour. Do you understand? He dropped Lupus onto the hard concrete of the breakwater. On his hands and knees, Lupus nodded and glanced quickly up at the lighthouse. There must be slaves at the top to feed the fire, but he couldn't see anyone. A great plume of black smoke was being fanned towards the town by the stiffening offshore breeze. From this close, the top seemed an immense height above him. At that moment, Lupus saw Avitus appear on the second level. He seemed very high up. 
Lupus scrambled to his feet and tried pointing again, but the soldier had already begun counting in a loud voice. Six, seven, eight. Wait, Grumex, said one of the other soldiers. I think I just saw someone up there. Garlic breath whirled round, but Avitus had disappeared again. They all squinted up at the red brick tower, looking for movement. Apart from the smoke billowing far above them, and a few gliding seagulls, there was nothing. In the silence, Lupus could hear the waves slapping against the breakwater, and he felt a fine spray on the side of his face. You're crazy, said Grumex, after a few moments, but he sounded doubtful. Better go and check anyway, he added after a moment. Then, noticing Lupus, he snarled. Go on, get out of here. Lupus was backing off when suddenly, behind him, a woman carrying a fishing net screamed. At the edge of the highest tier of the lighthouse, a figure stood silhouetted against the sky. A man, the woman shrieked, dropping her net and pointing. There's a man on the lighthouse and I think he's going to jump. <laughs>